Drake substitution is what we'll see today. Oh, Drake substitution. We can use this technique to integrate functions. All right, I'm going to stop because this is really awful. But yes, this is what we're going to see today. Drake substitution, which is another integration technique that involves trig functions. But it's quite different from what we've seen so far because here we're going to start with an integral that does not actually have trig functions in it. But we're going to use trig functions to simplify the integral. Pretty crazy, hey? Okay, so let's get started uh, and let's just work through an example. Suppose that I want to calculate the integral of 1 over square root of 1 minus x square dx. Well, if you remember what we've seen in previous weeks, you should probably know the answer right away. Because 1 over square root of 1 minus x square is exactly the derivative of the inverse sine function. So the answer here should be inverse sine of x plus a constant. Right, but suppose that we don't remember that, let's see whether we're able to actually calculate this integral. So the idea is the following. So we want to somehow replace x by a trig function so that we can take advantage of Pythagorean identities to simplify the integral. So if, for example, I was going to substitute x for sine of a new variable theta, then that would be pretty cool, because if I substitute in here, I get 1 minus sine square, which is just cos square. Right, so the integral would simplify. Let's just try it. So dx here would be cos theta d theta. So if I implement that in my integral, I get cos theta d theta over the square root of 1 minus sine square theta, which is just the integral of cos theta d theta. Now I can use the identity here that 1 minus sine square is just equal to cos square, so I'll get the square root of cos square theta in my denominator. Square root of cos square theta is just cos theta, so I end up with the integral of cos theta over cos theta, d simplify, just get the integral of d theta, which is theta plus a constant. But that's not over, of course, we need to uh, rewrite everything in terms of x. And now you see that what we've done is, is slightly different than standard substitution. So instead of defining a new variable u as a function of x, we've defined x as a function of a new variable theta. So to replace, to rewrite theta in terms of x, we somehow have to invert this relation here. But we know how to do that. If x is equal to sine theta, then theta is equal to inverse sine of x. So we can substitute there, this and here, and we get the result that the integral is equal to inverse sine of x plus a constant, which is exactly what we expected. Awesome. But now it's pretty cool is that we have we actually calculated it. Not only I mean we even if we didn't remember that this was the integral, we we found a way of calculating this integral. And it turns out that this approach, which is called trigonometric substitution, is super powerful and it can be used for more, much more complicated integrals than this one. Okay, so let me summarize this, summarize the steps. Uh, of trigonometric substitutions. So the idea is to use a substitution where we set x to a trig function, in this case was sine theta, in order to take advantage of the identity sine square plus cos square equals to 1. Now this is the general idea of trig substitutions. You want to replace x by a trig function of some new variable so that you can simplify the integral. It's not a standard substitution, it's an inverse substitution because instead of writing u as a function of x, we write x as a function of theta. And that's perfectly fine. The only subtlety here is we have to make sure that the function f of theta is 1 to 1. It turns out that in our case, we had x equals sine theta, which is not actually 1 to 1. So what we need to do is restrict the domain of sine theta. So we just uh, choose theta to be between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And if we do that, then it's fine. It becomes 1 to 1, and it can inverse it invert the relation to get theta is equal to inverse sine of x, which is exactly what I used in the last step of my previous calculation. All right, so this is the idea. So let me do a more complicated example. Suppose I'm trying to calculate the integral of 1 over x squared plus 4 to the power of 3 half. Well, so now I somehow want to do the same thing. I want to replace x by a trig function and somehow take advantage of the Pythagorean identities. Now what you realize here is that you have the sum of two times. So it makes sense to try to use the tan square theta plus 1 equals secant square theta identity instead of the sine square plus cos square equals to 1. 
but there's also a 4. So how can I somehow take the 4 into account? Well, the idea here is the following. So if I do the substitution x equals 2 tan of theta, then it's going to be cool, right? If I plug that in here, I get 4 tan square plus 4, which is really just 4 times tan square plus 1, namely 4 times secant square. So then the integral should simplify. All right, so let's try it. So if I do that, then dx is equal to 2 secant square of theta d theta. I can implement the substitution in my integral. I get 2 secant squared theta d theta in the numerator. Denominator will be 4 tan square theta plus 4 to the power of 3 half. All right, let's keep going. So I'll get 2 secant squared theta d theta. I can factor out the 4 to get tan squared theta plus 1 here. And now I use the fact that tan square plus 1 is equal to secant square of theta, which is what I wanted to use to simplify the integral. And if I do that, then I get that the uh, this is equal to 2 integral of secant square theta d theta over, now I have 4 to the power of 3 half. So this is really just 2 to the power of 3, which is 8 times secant square theta to the power of 3 half. I can simplify this further. 2 over 8 is just 1 over 4. Integral of secant square theta d theta over secant cube, which is the integral of 1 over 4. Integral of 1 over secant theta d theta, which is really just the integral of 1 over 4. Integral of cos theta d theta, and then we know what this is. This is 1 over 4 sine theta plus a constant. Very cool. But that's not the end of the story, of course. I need to rewrite everything in terms of x. Now, I could just use the fact that theta is going to be, in, is going to be equal to inverse tan of x over 2, but that would, not, that would just give me a mess. So the best way of doing it is to use our beloved triangle. So I'm just going to write this great triangle that we've used before, set my theta here. What do I know about theta? I know that tan of theta is equal to x over 2. So I can put this side of length x and this side of length 2, in which case I get square root of x squared plus 4 here. And from this, I can deduce that sine of theta is equal to x over square root x squared plus 4, which I can finally substitute back in here. I get 1 over 4 x over square root of x plus 4 plus my constant of integration. And that's the final result. Now, what's pretty cool here is that the original integral didn't have trig functions. The final integral also doesn't have trig functions. But somehow, the best way of evaluating this integral was by using trig functions. That's pretty crazy. Okay, so this is exactly what trig substitutions are about. And it turns out that this is a very general method. So just to be a little more general, any integrals that involve factors, possibly power of these factors, any powers of these factors, either a square minus x square, a square plus x square, or x square minus a square, or similarly if you divide by a square. So any uh, integral that involves powers of those uh, can be evaluated, generally speaking, with trig substitution. That's a good idea to try trig substitutions. Uh, you can try different ones, either x equals a sine theta, x equals a tan, tan theta, or x equals a secant theta for any constants a. And uh, one of them will probably work. Now, of course, the big question is, can we discover a general rule that will tell us which trig substitution will work for a given integral of this form. That's exactly like the question we had for trigonometric integrals in the previous video. That's not obvious. My advice again is to try a whole bunch of those and try to come up with the rule yourself. We're also going to study some of them uh, in class and see what kind of rule uh, we get. Now I have uh, another question here. So I've only written uh, trig substitution x equals sine and tan or secant, didn't write cos, cotan, or cosecant. Why is that so? 
I'll leave that as an exercise. We'll talk about we're going to talk about it in class. Uh, it's not so obvious, but it turns out that you will not gain anything new by including the other substitutions. So it's sufficient to only do these three substitutions. And one note that I want to end this video with is that after doing a trig substitution, pretty often you will end up with a trigonometric integral. Now, in the two examples I did, these integrals were pretty easy. The first one was just the integral of d theta. The second one was the integral of cos theta d theta. So they were easy. But if you have a complicated integral to start with, you may end up with a complicated trigonometric integral after a trig substitution. And if that's the case, then you may have to use the techniques of the previous video to evaluate this trig integral. So somehow trig substitution is the first step, then you may have to use uh, trig identities and so on to evaluate the trig integrals before you uh, rewrite everything in terms of x at the end. So it can be pretty, pretty lengthy and not so obvious. All right, so we'll do more examples of this technique in class.